Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name's Abe. I'm a UC Berkeley PhD student working under Kristo Sadovich. And I'm here to present Chipyard, which is our open source RISC-V SOC design framework. So let's actually break this down a little bit and try to build in some use cases of why you might want to use a tool like this. So for example, in this case, you have your custom SOC architecture, right? You have your particular new IP blocks, either written in Chisel, System Verilog, whatever it may be. And you want to reuse existing blocks, right? You're maybe building your accelerator, or you're building your own unique little memory, resistive RAM, whatever the case is. But you don't want to implement the entire world. You want to have cores that are available to you and the like. So not only do you have your SOC architecture, you also have to care about a lot of things down the line. I think this was present in some of the prior talks. You have to worry about register mappings. You have to worry about kind of EDA flows. There's a lot of other things you have to worry about. Kind of the first thing that you start worrying about is RTL simulation here, right? So how do I actually run something on it, make sure that this SOC architecture actually works for the case that I need it to be? Uh, machine learning, for example. Then you also have FPGA accelerated simulation, right? Maybe it's too slow some, running something like Verilator for Linux boot. How do I actually make that run faster and actually run some more interesting workloads? You also have FPGA prototyping, right? I have the SOC architecture. I want to run it even faster again. I can do it on an FPGA prototype, so I can maybe do some cool demos, connect it up to a camera, for example, or plug it into a robot. Finally, I think kind of like the, the, the golden thing here is, right, we want to actually tape out an SOC, right? We want to actually have our RTL, have our unique design, and actually take it all the way out to fruition, into silicon. So this is where Chipyard comes in. So Chipyard here is an organized framework to kind of combine all these aspects into one. It's basically a, an amalgamation of a bunch of SOC design tools and software that you can very quickly and easily make your own design inside of it and actually run to a particular flow. So as kind of highlighted here, it has a curated list of IP that exists in our open source world that we all know and love in RISC-V that you can actually plug and play to add your own unique item into. And in many cases, it's also a methodology so that you can do agile SOC design, right? You want to be able to iterate very quickly so that you can get your IP out and actually move on to the more important things in life. So I'll actually break down this diagram in a little bit more detail here, but let's actually take this step by step. So the first thing that I'd like to go into is this very top level here. Um, not exactly the configuration. We'll go into that in the next step here, but let's talk about RTL generators. So what is a Chipyard SOC. So if we're just taking a look at kind of the digital side of a Chipyard SOC, it is comprised of a bunch of different components. The kind of the first thing that I would like to highlight here are the tiles. So tiles here are what we call kind of like the core and some other components that are necessary to go with the core, like a PTW or a cache. In this case, you have cores like Rocket and Boom, and I'll talk about some of the other options that we have. But basically, this is the replicatable set of kind of processor IP that you can kind of stamp out in your SOC. And this is a fairly modularized interface, so you can plug in your own cores. And I'll go into that. So first, starting off with the two cores that some people might know here, to go into a little bit more depth. So Rocket, uh, synonymous with a Rocket Chip SOC project here, is the first open source RISC-V CPU. It's an in-order core, so it's fairly small, agile, and it works fairly well. It's been taped out in many uh, uh, taped out many different times, both at Berkeley and externally at different companies. So it's kind of a well-trodden, well-known core that's out there. You also have Berkeley's own Sonic Boom, which is another iteration of the Boom out-of-order core coming out of Berkeley. And this is an out-of-order superscalar core um, that you're able to parameterize in many different ways. And you can actually expose a lot of IPC within it. So you have a lot of nice advanced features like Tage branch prediction. You have uh, all the out-of-orderiness if you uh, uh, remember your uh, computer architecture class. And it's a great high performance design so that you can actually boot Linux very quickly and run uh, interesting workloads. And I think there's a lot of detail in all of this talk, but there's plenty of documentation online to see each of these units in a little bit more detail. But for example, boom here, you can do a lot of crazy things with it, and you can configure it in many different ways. Um, the nice thing is, is that since we are talking about RISC-V, it supports a lot of uh, default, uh, uh, it supports the RV64 GC ISA profile, so you're able to run a lot of off-the-shelf software, both in Linux and just bare metal tests. And we've actually tested it in a variety of ways, specifically running Linux boot, running databases, and things of the sort. And we've taped, in this, we've taped this out both internally at Berkeley, and other people have taped out things like Rocket externally. Um, it's also described in Chisel. You heard a little bit about Chisel from Jack and some of the other folks here. 
Um, so this is uh, one of the projects that uses it. Um, however, we're not in an all chisel world. There's plenty of other things that exist out there. And if we're just talking about processors themselves, you have things like CVA6, which was talked about in the open hardware group uh, world, as well as IBEX as well. So here you have uh, a bunch of synth, uh, uh, system Verilog IP that you can actually plug into Chipyard and use as well, right? So if you're not entirely comfortable with Chisel just yet, you can go ahead and take these cores, plug them in, and already use them inside of the Chipyard flow, and still have all of the backend, which we'll go into a little bit more detail here. So uh, Arian is one example. It's another in-order core that exists out there, and IBEX, which is a smaller uh, microcontroller-based core. So there's more IP here. So if you're looking at it from the educational perspective, right, sometimes it's kind of, kind of hard to dive into a very beefy in-order, out-of-order core and kind of learn all the ins and outs of how it works. So we actually have a bunch of other cores that are integrated into Chipyard for education purposes that kind of range all the way from the one-stage type processors that you might see all the way out to five-stage five stage implementation. So this is what we use inside of classes, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. But it's very good to just get started with what is a processor? What is a register? How do I actually connect all these components up all together? For the more verification focused uh, people here, we have a new feature in the newest version of Chipyard, which is called Spike as a tile. And basically, Spike, if you're not already aware, is our functional model for RISC V here. We're able to kind of plug it into the Chipyard ecosystem so that it can actually serve as a pseudo CPU. And basically, we can still use all of the nice backend features of Chipyard and the rest of the SSC architecture. So what's nice here is that you can quickly write up your functional model, plug it into Spike, and actually work with all of Chipyard's peripherals and kind of plug into the rest of the flow. Um, so this is a nice new experimental feature here. Um, a lot of people like talking about accelerators, so I'll give a little plug for the accelerator side here. So uh, Chipyard also supports something that's called the Rock Accelerator Interface. So we use this a lot at Berkeley to do a lot of tightly coupled accelerator research. Um, this includes machine learning accelerators, vector accelerators, and the like. And we're able to plug this into things like Rocket and Boom. So what is this actually in a little bit more depth? I actually won't dive into the details too much here, but you can view it as a way to interact with processor registers and also interact with the memory system. right? So you can still do um, tightly coupled accelerator research. And we have plenty of examples of this, like the Gemini Machine Learning Accelerator. If people are in the machine learning space, uh, you might have heard of that before. It's a very popular machine learning accelerator that's out there, as well as vector accelerators and much, much more. This is just a small set. So you can plug in your own accelerator there. You can plug it in in something like System Verilog, as I mentioned, or in Chisel as well if you want to dive into that world. Um, Rock isn't the only world to do some sort of integration, right? So you can also do some sort of MMIO attached peripheral. I'm calling it an accelerator here, but it's not relegated to that. You can do a lot of MMIO mapped registers to connect to your uh, uh, peripheral here. And we have examples like NVDLA, the machine learning accelerator from NVIDIA, integrated in, as well as some other examples as well. Um, so we talked a little bit about processor IP and accelerators here, but how do we actually connect everything together? Well, we have a tiling-based interconnect that actually connects and spans out throughout the, throughout the entire SOC. So tiling is our open source chip scale interconnect standard here, very similar to kind of like an Axie connector. And we have a variety of uh, IP that you can actually plug in your existing AMBA-based uh, protocols into tiling so that you can actually convert from your Axie-based world into tiling and it plugs in nicely. So for example here, that's how we actually integrated some of these uh, system Verilog-based IP, such as CVA6 and NVDLA. We basically wrote up a wrapper, added in a little adapter so that it would convert it to Tilink, and then voila, we're now part of the entire ecosystem here. So there's a lot more detail that's going to be talked about this in a future talk by Jerry. That's going to be uh, tomorrow, so shout out to that. Uh, but we also have an on-chip interconnect generator as well, so you can actually do highly parameterized SOCs, where you can actually not only do a simple crossbar-based interconnect, but you can also scale out to different types of meshes and, and, and uh, other types of knocks. So I'll let Jerry uh, talk about that in much more detail. It's a very interesting talk, so I urge you to stay tuned for that. 
What about memory, right? We need to have something to store our data or instructions, right? So here we have our open source, or we have an open source tiling based L2 cache that was developed by Sci5 and open sourced and put into Chipyard um, that you can connect out into the rest of your SOC. If you don't want it, you can get rid of it and you can have broadcast based coherence, which is fine. And then we also have uh, a connection out to uh, DRAM here. So you can have uh, DRAM sim, which is another open source DRAM simulator or you can plug into your own model, whatever the case is. So you have some memory here. Um, in terms of peripherals and I.O., some people were talking about what about like your UART, your SPY, and some of the other sessions here. You have that as well inside of Chipyard. It's e easily configurable here, and you basically have a whole suite of things that you can talk to the outside world with. Um, and additionally, we have some Chipyard unique things like certies and scratch pads that you can also integrate as well. So all available and all open source. So, very quickly went through the SOC architecture, um, but there's much, much more here. Feel free to talk to me afterwards. Now, we talked about the generators here, but how do we actually configure all this? There's a lot of different blocks that all connect together in weird ways. How do we actually configure this? And that's what we call our configuration system. It's based off of Rocket Chip's uh, config system, and it's basically like this. You specify a single class inside of this Scala Chisel world, and it basically configures everything you might want to do inside of this SOC. So as you can see, we have kind of unique names indicating maybe I want to modify the L1, maybe I want to add accelerators, and you can add it to particular cores, you can get rid of it from particular cores, change the bus hierarchy, and much, much more. So uh, a lot more detail here, but this is kind of a quick look of how you might configure the system to add, delete, modify things. So, we talked a little bit about kind of the front end. How do I actually specify the SSC architecture? But let's actually talk a little bit about the back ends here. So there's plenty of back ends here. So the first one is software RTL simulation, right? So you're doing RTL level simulation with something like Verilator VCS or Exilium, which we all support inside of Chipyard um, with a plug and play interface. You have FPGA prototyping. If you want to do quick prototyping, dump out your RTL onto a particular FPGA and make sure you can boot Linux. Um, we actually use this for bring up for our particular chips, so we use the same flow internally. Uh, you have Hammer, which was talked about by Nayiri earlier on in another talk, so you can actually take this out to a particular uh, PDK. And then you also have FireSim, which was talked about earlier as well, which is we use to do accelerated simulations with FPGAs. So diving into software RTL simulation. So like I said, we, we have uh, hooks here for Verilator, VCS, and Exilium, but we're not relegated to just that. You can also plug in your own simulator inside, and we're working with a couple of people to potentially do that as well. And it's very easy. It's a plug and play interface to add your own simulator as well. Um, you have FPGA prototyping, right? You have an FPGA, you want to just run your RTL on it. You can plug and play it inside of Chipyard as well. So, we use this for our integrated uh, chip bring up flow. We, we have a lot of different features that are there that I don't have time to get into, but um, it's very useful in its own way. Um, I won't go into FireSim and Hammer because they've been discussed in other talks, but uh, you're welcome to look at that as well for a deeper dive into those particular flows. Now, we have a bunch of different uh, backend flows. We need to start talking about, okay, how do we actually integrate the digital system that we have into all of these different flows? So one thing that I would like to talk about here is basically the notion of a test harness and kind of your, your digital system and how it inter interacts with the outside world. So in kind of a normal world, which is on the left here, you can see that you have like your digital top and it's somehow connected out to simulation models uh, and the like. For example, going out to UART, you're printing something out onto your screen, into your terminal. Um, in the FireSim world, which is a little bit different here, you maybe have to have some things that live uh, kind of over the simulation boundary that lives on an FPGA or on an x86 host. In an ASIC world, it's kind of a similar thing. You basically have your chip that exists, you might have some IO cells, and then you may be attached to an FPGA that's doing bring up, right? There's a lot of different kind of things that span this boundary. So for Chipyard, we have our own particular configuration interface that allows us to modify both the digital system, modify the thing in between, which we call the chip IO, and then also modify what we call the harness as well. So fairly standard terms for these things. So in the case of something like a normal digital simulation here, you can take the config object that you would see, these lines of Scala code that you use to modify everything, and you can basically modify the top level system, caches, cores, etc. You can modify kind of this in-between layer that attaches your harness to the rest of the digital system. 
as well as the harness itself, right? I can add different models uh, like UARTs and JTAG, et cetera. So blazingly flask going through it, now we have to connect up all of this like IOs that we connect up from our SOC to the actual back and flows, the simulators and the like. And this is where fertile and circuit comes in. So we had a circuit talk and I'm gonna talk about circuit and why it's so great again. So in the elaboration flow for something like Chipyard, you take our chisel and then you basically run a bunch of fertile passes onto it so that it maps down to those particular backends, whether it be FPGA accelerated simulation, a very later simulation and the like. And we use circuit inside of Chipyard now and it basically allows you to do extremely big design space exploration, right? You can simulate uh, hundreds of cores, uh, generate hundreds of cores with memories and the like. So you'll notice that I haven't talked anything about software, right? So the SOC architecture is one part of the story, how I simulate it is another part, but what about the binaries and, and Linux distributions that I'm building on it, right? So what happened with all the software side? So kind of going back to what is software? Software is a bunch of different things, whether it's the actual sources like Linux, various amounts of scripts that you have that run in Linux, things that build things, and just a bunch of miscellaneous things. There's too much to talk about. Um, this is basically another tool that we have inside of Chipyard that's called Fire Marshal. So Fire Marshal is basically a way that you can write a reusable code snippet that basically dictates how you're going to build your software that is uniform to all these different backend flows and supports multiple different types of uh, SOCs and boards and the like. So this is kind of a simplified example where you can basically specify a particular Linux configuration. You're specifying how you're going to build binaries for uh, uh, Linux distribution, right? You're cross compiling and then what command you're going to run. Let's say ResNet, right, on Linux. And basically, Fire Marshal is a way that you can quickly and easily write software for Chipyard. So examples that we uh, have working inside of Fire Marshal is running things like Build Root Linux, Fedora Linux. Uh, we have a bunch of different hooks inside of it so that you can actually post-process the output from your particular simulations with it uh, and much, much, much more. So that was kind of the, the very quick overview of Chipyard here. You have things all the way up from the configuration itself, you know, what, uh, what's the size of the cache, what cores do you want? You have the actual RTL generators, so you have a variety of accelerators, cores, caches, memory, and the like. You have the, the middle part, which is the actual elaboration flow. This is all the nitty gritty compiler research uh, loveliness that people like, um, like circuit. And then you have kind of the, the bottom end, the simulation flow is what you're trying to target, right? Simulation, FPGA, prototyping, and the like. So Chipyard is actually used for education. So I talked about it a little bit from, you know, what does it have? But it's also used inside of uh, research and education, starting off with education here. We use it for a variety of Berkeley architecture courses. This includes hardware for machine learning all the way down to your uh, computer architecture classes. So some of the interesting designs and things that we've done in classes is you replicate Spectre with Boom, our out of order core. You actually implement different types of uh, uh, cache replacement policies inside of Rocket. You learn how to build benchmarks, run benchmarks, and the like, right? So you can imagine that in this large SOC world, there's a lot of different things that you need to touch, and we touch on the majority of them in our classes as well. And the nice thing here is that for students, they have a, an initial uh, overhead of actually learning the tool for one particular class, but that overhead is amortized over all the rest of the classes, right? So you learn it once in kind of your intro to digital design class, and then you end up doing computer architecture research with it, you end up doing uh, uh, VLSI with it, it's kind of a one-stop shop to do everything. So it's great for students to kind of learn some tool once, and then be able to build off it for the rest of their education. In terms of tape outs, Jerry mentioned this a little bit uh, earlier in the day today. So we actually also use this for tape outs both uh, for research and for classes as well. And it serves as a standard place that people can just fork off of this particular repo at a particular point in time, uh, add their own unique uh, accelerators or the like, uh, basically evaluate it very quickly with something like FireSim, and then actually use it in a back-end VLSI flow, something like Hammer. And then, of course, Chipyard also brings in kind of the bring-up side as well, so you can actually bring up things inside of this entire ecosystem. And the nice thing about Chipyard is that since it serves as this one-stop shop for uh, RISC-V 
um, SOCs here, it actually allows us to have a singular source of truth for the entire trip. So you can kind of work in this entire environment and basically have all your integration and testing all in one. Um, uh, so again, very quickly talking about tapeouts here. Uh, students have been able to do tapeouts in a single semester with a little asterisk on the side, uh, view Jerry's talk. But I think the overall thing here is that this class is growing, I, I don't want to say exponentially, but it's growing very, very quickly. And it's just showing how the power of like an SOC design framework allows you to actually scale out and do chip tape outs with multiple different students from you know a couple of students inside of the research lab, maybe three or four on a particular tape out, all the way to 40, 50, and more students in a class. And of course, plenty of examples of chip tape outs, both in, in classes, but also in research. And these are just kind of two examples here um, of particular uh, dye photos here um, from spring 2021 and spring 2022 with the variety of uh, undergrads working on it and PhD students working on it. So with that, what's, what's happening in terms of the community? So, you know, Chipyard is a big project. There's a lot of moving parts. I blazed through them very, very quickly. We have a lot of documentation about how do you actually get started. We have tutorials for Chipyard and the variety of subproducts that are within and outside of Chipyard that use it. We have a mailing list that's uh, very, very active. A lot of people ask questions all the time on it. There was a couple today already. Um, and then, of course, as with all Berkeley projects, this is open source, right? So you're able to ask any questions, put in feature requests, ask for PRs, do PRs, whatever the case is. We also host plenty of tutorials on this tool and a variety of other Berkeley tools. For example, at top architecture conferences like ISCA, Micro, ASPLOS, and HPCA. And we cover a variety of things from this particular talk into more detailed nitty gritty about how do you actually de debug things and use this entire flow. So I urge you to go look at the, the website there if you want to look at our tutorial, uh, for example, from ASPLOS. And the nice thing is, is that since the tutorial users are brand new, they can still do very, very complex designs. So for example, at this ASPOS tutorial, we basically allowed them to create this extremely large SOC configuration in under 10 minutes and simulate it all the way through with bare metal tests. So you have things like multiple out-of-order cores. These are very big, beefy out-of-order cores. Uh, you have the in-order cores all on this uh, uh, mesh knock interconnect um, with L2 banks kind of striped throughout as well as accelerators down here at the bottom and DRAM connected at the top, right? So designs that are normally very hard for someone who's never used this tool before, they were able to get working in under 10 minutes, give or take. Um, additionally, Chipyard has also had its first workshop recently at ASPLOS, where we had a variety of external talks from folks, uh, both developers and users. Um, so you can go ahead and look at the link there if you want to look at some of the videos of how people actually use this tool to do some of their interesting research and other uh, works. Um, some great talks there. And so with that, I'll go ahead and end on this slide. So Chipyard is an extensible research platform for your particular needs with RISC-V SOCs. It has a variety of different IP for, that, you need to, or that you could use for your particular project, whether it's memory IP, CPU, uh, IOs, peripherals, whatever the case is. And it's all open sourced, and we are community and research friendly. Um, here are the links to our GitHub, as well as our documentation. Uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Questions? Question in the back. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. So when you're configuring, uh, when you're building one of these configuration objects and you're passing all of these options, um, how do you know which options compose with which other options? It seems like it's very easy to, maybe it's very easy to get them wrong. Yes, yes. So that's a great thing. So uh, like you mentioned, these are all, well, I didn't mention this in the talk. I don't think I said generators anywhere in this talk, which is my bad. But there's a lot of different configuration options for any of these different cores, whether it's uh, the size of your register file, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, the, knowing the correct configuration uh, snippets, uh, we don't have a particular flow for that right now. But it's a very quick turnaround time to actually see what goes wrong. So when you first generate a design within about a minute or two, depending on how big or small the design is, you can at least get feedback to know, is the configuration incorrect? Um, so if you do give an incorrect knob, there's a quick turnaround time to see like a red error. So basically, it's kind of a little bit of trial and error. 
Now we do have a lot of examples designs of how to do you know, SOCs like we showed um, and much, much more to help out in that way. Yeah. So the, is the feedback provided during chisel elaboration or is it simulation or is it like the config generator really knows that your bus needs to be this big if you have these many cores? Yeah, so a lot of it is basically when you implement the particular IP, call it a core, and you say, I want a register file that has 1,000 entries, uh, the designer hopefully put, hey, you can't have a register file that supports 1,000 entries, right? They put some sort of like assertion bound. So you'll get feedback on that end. Um, you also get feedback back into the compiler flow. So if you do something weird and you don't have a wire connected up properly, you'll actually get feedback from something like Circuit to tell you, hey, this wire is un uh, unconnected, kind of like generic chisel fertile stuff. Um, and then you also have like another level of testing through just like running assembly tests and stuff. So I guess there's multiple levels, but the way that I interpret your question is kind of the first level. You get an immediate feedback within like a minute or two, depending on the size of the design. Yeah. I have a yes. question. Um, great talk, thank you. I love the idea that you're kind of onboarding people, uh, students, as they come into the sort of, you know, the course early on, mm -hmm. and they use this all the way through because I think I think that really helps. It, it, it is a bit confusing if you kind of chop and change between yeah. IP to learn, you know, implementation versus you know design and things like that. So that's great. Um, I have a question about the state of Rocket and with regards to complicated things inside it like diplomacy uh, and also chisel yep. uh, as, as a chisel you know language evolves um, how I mean are you guys sort of taking it upon yourselves to keep it more or less up to date with the latest yep. chisel and and with you know I, I know sci5 pretty much no longer contribute to open source rocket which makes sense um, but it would be a shame to see it kind of stagnate and fall behind especially if it was not compatible with the latest chisel so Yep. What, what do you see as sort of like the, the role of not only using it in education, but also trying to keep it um, up to date? Yeah, so that's a great question. So in terms of the Chisel project, there's still plenty of development on like the sci-fi side as well as the open source side, working on things like Chisel. In terms of Rocket Chip, for the most part, it's moved on to a separate set of developers that are outside the sci-fi side, and they continue to keep it up to date with both Chisel as well as new features. And so whenever those new features comes out, and we make sure that they're clean enough to put into Chipyard. Chipyard, in a sense, is like a giant CI flow for Rocket Chip in a way. So we put it into Chipyard, and we actually run it through, and we make sure everything works, right? So when you check out Chipyard on a particular main branch or release, we're kind of guaranteeing, to a certain extent, you're able to like boot Linux and run things. Um, so on the Rocket Chip side, uh, we are basically also like helping out with development of that and like kind of pushing that forward. Um, I think that was kind of the rocket chip side. Did I miss any other part of your question there? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, do, do you get much feedback from people in industry who are using it? Um, so, in terms of industry inside of or uh, industry use, uh, I think a lot of the industry use comes from using a lot of the other backend flows like Hammer or FireSim, for example, and then that basically propagates down into Chipyard um, because a lot of times when you check out something for, let's say, FireSim, you end up using Chipyard along the way. So that's how we get a lot of feedback. Um, external users who've used Chipyard and kind of the other associated tools, um, a lot of it is used inside of like simulation flows or kind of like their research settings. Um, I don't know of any production uh, Chipyard use outside of Berkeley and some of the chip tape outs that we've done uh, at Berkeley. Um, so I guess I'll leave it at that. I, I think we still need to hear back from some companies. So if people are using the tool, please let us know. We would be ha happy to support you all. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Um, so uh, how would you advertise this class to a student who wanted to get uh, like into chip development, yeah. um, but wanted like hard skills that could be applied in industry? Yeah. Um, and knowing that a Chipyard and, um, and Hammer maybe isn't used like in every uh, oh. large company. So how would, you, how would you advertise it to that student? Yes, so to be clear, the, the classes are kind of split up into like bite-sized chunks for particular cases, right? So you have kind of your intro to digital design class, which is basically like pumping through Hammer and figuring out how to actually mess with EDA tools, mess around with synthesis. So you're still getting hands-on feedback that way. Um, for like our architecture classes, a lot of that is not necessarily bound to a particular tool, right? 
Um, as an architecture person, you need to understand, OK, well, this is what a cache does and how it interacts with the memory subsystem and how it interacts with the core. So you're still getting those things. Um, as for Chipyard itself, I think a lot of it is just you know, you're implementing it in RTL. And I think that itself is a very transferable skill. Um, Chisel, you can write you know, all the way to the extremely scholarly, kind of crazy, like programmatic like Chisel, all the way down to like very simple Verilog-esque like Chisel. So there's a lot of transferable skills there. Um, and a lot of these tools, and I think the Chipyard and all the associated tools kind of show this, is that we add a lot of hooks for people who don't want to mess around with all this generatory like automation stuff. They can actually like hand mess around with the tools, right? If you want to actually mess around with Verilator and run simulations, if you want to build your binaries yourself, you can do it all yourself. And we always add hooks in, in that because inevitably, if something goes wrong, whether it's on a tape out at the end, you know, sometimes you want to add in like a quick hook to fix it up, right? So a lot of it is about transferable skills. That's what I'd say. But there's always avenues, especially in the classes, for students to get down to the nitty gritty of writing particular tool commands or, you know, integrating Verilog IP into their design for a tape out class. We, uh, we allow that inside of this ecosystem as well. Any other question? Uh, so ha have you considered using uh, something like Edelweiss <coughs> for the tool flows that you don't support? I mean, you have some a nice backend um, uh, abstraction layer there. Uh, I'll be frank. I don't know what Edelweiss is. I'm not sure if I pronounced it. <laughs> Sorry. I will talk with you immediately afterwards, <laughs> and we will see how it can be integrated into this project, because I'm sure it's not an issue at all. So tomorrow, you might hear some more news on that. Yeah, so. I hope you bring an emotional support kit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's thank Abe. Cheers, mate. Thank you.